Good afternoon. My name is Sheila Virgil. Uh, I'm the Assistant Dean of Development at Wake Forest University School of Divinity. On behalf of the Office of the Dean and faculty of Wake Divinity, I would like to welcome you to the Elizabeth and Robert Strickland Speaker Series on Religion. This speaker series was established in 2021 by Mrs. Elizabeth Strickland in memory of her late husband, Robert Strickland. A voracious reader with a deep commitment to spiritual inquiry and theological education, Mrs. Strickland wanted to underwrite this lecture series as part of her larger commitment to Wake Divinity, which includes scholarship dollars to support the education of numerous Wake Divinity students. I am pleased to acknowledge the presence of Mrs. Betty Strickland here today, along with several members of her family. Thank you for your generosity, Mrs. Strickland. This speaker series helps us to live out our mission of fostering agents of justice, reconciliation, and compassion. It helps us to educate architects of hope, equity, and healing. To introduce today's speaker, I now welcome to the lectern Professor Catherine Shainer, Associate Professor of New Testament at Wake Divinity. Professor Shainer. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you, Mrs. Strickland, for your generosity. It's my great honor to introduce this afternoon's speaker. Elaine H. Peggles is the Harrington Spear Payne Foundation Professor of Religion at Princeton University. Her bibliography of published works is stunning. It's not just for its length. There are nine books, more than four dozen articles, and untold numbers of guest lectures, media appearances, interviews. As if these numbers weren't impressive enough, the impact and depth of her work is incalculable. She is a National Book Award and National Book Critics Circle Award winner for her third book, The Gnostic Gospels in which she introduces lay readers, that is, those beyond the Religious Studies Academy, to the world of second century texts about Jesus, the disciples, and Christian theology that some leaders in the early church declared heretical and successfully kept out of circulation from the fourth century on. Professor Peggles is the recipient of the MacArthur Prize, sometimes called the Genius Fellowship and has held Rockefeller, Guggenheim, and many other prestigious fellowships in her prolific career. In 2013, she received an honorary degree from Harvard University, and in 2016, President Barack Obama awarded her the National Medal for the Humanities. And that's just a partial list. Professor Peggles' work has been both a strong foundation and a touchstone in my own career as well. You see, as the first woman to earn a PhD from Harvard University in New Testament and early Christianity, my own pathway through that august institution would not have been possible without her forbearing and stone ceiling breaking work. For those of you who've read tonight's book, you have a small sense of how difficult that particular experience was. Not only was she learning how to read a language, that few people had deciphered, that is, ancient Coptic. And she was encountering ancient Christian texts that had literally been buried for 1,500 years. But she was also struggling under deeply entrenched and institutionally enabled misogyny. Now, this work is not finished, either intellectually or institutionally, but I am grateful to stand in a line of several generations of brilliant women in our field, with Professor Peggles at the root. Because of your work, Professor Peggles, I graduated with a doctoral committee composed only of tenured women at Harvard University. Because of your work, Professor Peggles, the Academy of Women is brighter, sharper, and stronger. So I thank you for that. Bringing her insatiable intellectual and spiritual curiosity to Wake Div, Professor Peggles will speak with us this afternoon about her book, Why Religion? A Personal Story. The book is a personal memoir dealing with the loss of her young child, followed by the loss of a spouse, all while asking broad questions about suffering and belief in the 21st century. It asks questions about the nature and purpose of suffering, about the experience of grief, 
and about how our religious culture shapes these experiences, and perhaps most profoundly, how texts few of us know much of anything about, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Truth, Thunder Complete Mind, how these texts provide an unexplored and well-deep resource for exploring these questions in the search for meaning. Weaving the personal and intellectual stories of her life together, Professor Peggles writes with the same passion as John of the Cross in Dark Night of the Soul, the same intellectual acuity of Anselm's faith-seeking understanding, and the same reflective sensibility as Dorothy Day's long loneliness. If you are curious, of course, about something that you read or hear in today's lecture, um, you can use the link that will be provided on the screen um, to add to to our questions through the Menti system. It'll be provided at the end of her talk. Please use the link and the code that is on the screen. We'll be collating questions and trying to touch on as many as possible in our conversation after the talk with Professor Peggles. Speaking of which, please welcome Professor Elaine Peggles to the Wake Forest University School of Divinity. Thank you so much, Professor Shainer, for that wonderfully generous introduction. It's great to know that Harvard is a, is a different kind of place now. It's quite a wonderful place, but I'm sure it's better for the women that we know who are now there. And I really want to thank the dean and, and Mrs. Strickland and her family, and Dean Walton, and uh, the faculty of this remarkable school. I was asked to talk about this very personal book. It's not like anything else I've ever written. I, you know, I write history of religion. But at a certain point, I needed to write something else. And I didn't know if I'd ever publish it. Um, and finally, I thought, why not? It's just what it is. So this is the one that, that I was asked to share with you today, quite briefly. So the questions, why religion? Somebody said, well, I read your book and you didn't answer the question. <laughs> well, you know, it's a, it's a thematic question, right? It's a question that's followed me my whole life and that I've tried to follow <laughs> throughout my whole life. And there are a number of parts of that, and these are some of them. Why, the, the question with which I really started is the first one. Uh, why is religion still around in the 21st century? That came out of the experience of growing up in California and in a little town, uh, going to a small Methodist church looked like that. There were pictures of Jesus that looked like that on the wall. It was, it was a sort of okay little church. It was a little boring. But apart from that, um, my father, however, didn't like Christianity because he had come from what he thought of as a ferociously Presbyterian family. And he was very grateful to, to abandon Christianity as soon as he discovered Charles Darwin, who's the figure on the right. Uh, as soon as he discovered science and evolution, he dropped Christianity and became a research biologist. And he taught us that Religion is for uneducated people. It's not for people who understand science. It's not for people who think. It's just for um, people who don't know any better. So that was the kind of snobbish attitude that I grew up with. And there were things I deeply loved when I was growing up as a teenager. Dance and poetry and music. And it was a range of, these are some of the favorites, the Hopi dances in the mesas of uh, New Mexico, uh, the dances of the Alvanelli Company, that's the dance called Revelation, the poetry of John Donne on, on the right, um, the music, music from Aretha Franklin to Bach. I loved all of those, um, but I didn't understand where they were taking me until later. So 
when I was about 14 or 15, I was invited in high school to go up to San Francisco for the afternoon on a boring Sunday afternoon in Palo Alto, and there were lots of those. So I said, great, and went, went up with my friends. I didn't know what we were getting into. I didn't know that we were going to a Billy Graham crusade. I wouldn't have known who he was. But there, in the sports stadium where I'd seen um, baseball games, there were 18,000 people. And there were 6,000 packed into the parking lot behind the 18,000 people. And, and the, the, the streets were blocked all around San Francisco. I, I learned this much later. This was a, uh, an enormous event at the time for many people. And the preacher was quite compelling. He was energetic, he was passionate, he was intense about the way he spoke. He said things that surprised me a lot. And then at the end, you know what to expect, the altar call, his voice dropped dramatically, and he said, you can be born again, you can start a new life, you can be part of the family of God, um, you can be transformed. And there was a choir of about 6,000 people singing, just as I am, right? It was wonderful. And I loved it. I, so I, I just dived right in and joined thousands of people as others were praising God for everyone being saved that day. Turned out my parents were furious uh, and shocked. But I joined a small evangelical church in Palo Alto and was deeply engaged in it for, uh, for about a year. And um, what I realized, what purpose does religion serve? The first thing I thought of when somebody asked me that question is, because some of us need it. I didn't know I was one of those, but, but when, when that experience, I felt as though I'd been living on a flat earth. And suddenly there was another dimension in it. There was a cosmic dimension that our lives could be lived on a screen that was as large as the universe. You know, there was God and Satan and Jesus Christ, and we were all part of this great cosmic drama. We participated in it. What we do matters. There was powerful meaning in it. It was, it was a transformation, and it was something that changed my life. And it still has, although not quite in the way the, pe the preacher then suggested it would. Somebody else said, so what purpose does religion serve? Well, it, it can open up another dimension of experience. And part of it, uh, as the theologian James Cone said, part of it is about the imagination. He said, what else would theology be? It would be about the imagination. But it's, that doesn't mean it wasn't real. It means that what we imagine is deeply part of what, how we experience ourselves. So that was an extraordinary uh, experience, and one that's stayed with me in many ways. But other people said, ask me this question today, why do people argue so much about religion? Why does it start such conflict and war? And I thought this, you know, the questions it raises can't be solved by rational argument or science or anything like that. They just move through these emotional currents, enormous intensity uh, in, in the lives of people who participate in these traditions, as I was participating in them then. And one of those currents of emotion is what jolted me out of that evangelical church I, I belong to. Um, I've been part of it, as I said, intensely for over a year, when suddenly one of my friends in high school uh, was in an automobile accident and uh, was killed in the accident. And all of us who knew him were very deeply shocked and upset. And I went back to this evangelical church and I said, this, this terrible thing happened. And the people there said, Oh, that's, that's terrible. Was he born again? And I said, no, he was Jewish. 
And they said, well, then he's in hell. And I, I was so shocked. I felt like I'd been socked in the stomach. And I thought, you know, oh, I thought this was about the love of God. But for this group, it seemed at that moment to be about the group and how they were spiritually on a much better plane than anybody else, more than about the love of God. So I, I was just stunned. And I walked out of there alone and desolate and never went back. So after that, I joined the group of friends that I had known through our friend who, who had died in the accident. They were people who were making music and writing poetry and well, everybody wanted to be an artist of some sort. Uh, it was a wonderful, exciting time, and the, the art that I felt closest to. And by the way, that's when I understood better about the poems, the music, and all of that that I had loved. Because all of those, the dances, for example, on the pueblos of New Mexico, were out of religious ritual. The dances of the Alvin Ailey Company was out of the Book of Revelation. The poems of John Donne, some of them are wonderful love poems, and the one that aren't are his divine poems. Uh, the music of Aretha Franklin came out of her father's church and, and that tradition, and the music of Bach came out of the Lutheran church. I didn't know that that music and those poems and those words and those rituals had already taken me into what I think of as a kind of spiritual dimension, which I needed and which I found uh, in a different way in that experience at the Billy Graham crusade. So at that point, I was really, I loved modern dance, so I decided to go to New York and become a professional dancer. So I went to New York, and the only dance I knew, because this is you know, pretty provincial California, I, I, I'd heard of Martha Graham. So I went to the Martha Graham school, and her, her um, troupe of dancers were teaching classes for people who came in like this. This is a, a, a class at the Martha Graham School. It was wonderful. Um, I loved it. After a while, I sort of realized that I was pretty good, but that being pretty good gets you nowhere in New York. I mean, you know, it would be waiting on tables the rest of my life, and I didn't want to do that. So I thought, okay, what's a plan B? And at that point, I thought there was something that hit me pretty hard at the Billy Graham crusade. What was it? I mean, was it Christianity or could it have been Buddhism or some other tradition or was it, what was it about? And what do we know about Jesus? What can we find out if we're just trying to find out historically? So I looked through graduate programs and, and there was one that was in a school that was it started as a religious school, but isn't anymore. Um, you could study Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, or Christianity. And, and there were these programs. And so I went there. Uh, and that was Catherine Shaner's university at Harvard. This is my first advisor. And I thought he, he, he looked like a sort of Ingmar Bergman version of God. He was quite fierce. His name was Christer Stendhal. It turned out he's a magnificent man, but he was pretty fierce. And so he sort of looked at me coming from California, knowing nothing. And he finally said, all right, so why did you come here? And I mumbled something about I wanted to find out the essence of Christianity. And he looked at me fiercely and he said, how do you know it has an essence? And I thought, wow, that's an amazing question. I never thought about that. I thought, I've come to the right place. He's, he's made me think. I never thought of asking that question before. But then I really knew I'd come to the right place when I found out that the professors of New Testament were suddenly the recipients of an enormous discovery. This is the discovery that Catherine Shaner talked about. Uh, 51 ancient early Christian texts 
that were found in this cave in Upper Egypt. It's about an hour from the city of Luxor in Upper Egypt. 51 ancient texts, including five gospels that we'd never seen before. They're thousands of years old, practically. And they were found in a, in a big jar, uh, hidden, because they, they, they were thought of as lost gospels, but actually they weren't lost. Um, it, the bishops said they were lost, but what they meant is that they tried very hard to get rid of them. And they destroyed them and burned them and banned them and called them heretical. And even Christer Stendhal said later, we thought these gospels were just weird. And we did. But when I first encountered them, uh, the, the Gospel of Thomas was the first one that became available. And these are some of the people, Jean Dorès, one of the first uh, scholars who took a look at the Gospel of Thomas, and he read the first line, and it says, these are the secret sayings which the living Jesus spoke and which the twin Judas Thomas wrote down. It's startling. Sayings of Jesus, there's no narrative in this gospel, as you may well know. It's just a list of sayings. And when I started to read it, this is the one that stood out to me. It's the one I always think about. When I, this one stopped me in my tracks. Right? If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you, and so forth. And if you don't, what you don't bring forth will destroy you. I thought, wow, this is, this is surprising, powerful. Now, you probably know that Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Bishop um, of Lyon in, in what is now France, who, a missionary from Syria at the time, and he's really the father of Christian orthodoxy. He had said nearly 2,000 years ago, well, of course, there are other gospels. The heretics say they have gospels, but theirs are just full of blasphemy, and they're basically insanity. Um, just, they're worthless. And I was infatuated with these secret Gospels. And so I wrote this little book in, just out of graduate school called The Gnostic Gospels and found out that the reviewer for the New York Times was the, the uh, most important man in our field at the time, Raymond Brown, um, who basically said, well, they were garbage in the first century, they're still garbage. So he agreed with Irenaeus, essentially. Uh, that was the start. But the question that they raised is, they say, these are the secret teachings of Jesus. Did Jesus have a secret teaching? And of course, Irenaeus, years ago, had established orthodoxy by saying, no. Jesus taught publicly. And what he taught publicly is in the Gospels that are familiar to you. You've read Mark, Matthew, and Luke. This is public teaching of Jesus. He didn't write, he didn't teach secretly. But others, like Professor Geza Vermesh at Oxford, said, well, you know, if he taught the way other first century rabbis did, yes, he would have said one thing to public congregations, crowds out in the fields, and then when he was alone with his closest circle of followers, he would teach them advanced level teaching. That's what rabbis did then, and many do now. And the Gospel of Mark says, yes. If you read the Gospel of Mark chapter four, you know that there it says, Jesus did exactly that. He said to the disciples when they were alone, I'm giving you the secret, and then the Greek word is mysterion, the mystery. I'm giving you the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to people out there, everything is, is in parables. I, I'm not teaching them any of the secret teaching. So Mark suggests that he did have a secret teaching. And unlike Mark, which doesn't clue you into what that might have been, the Gospel of Thomas does claim to reveal the secret of the kingdom of God. So you may know this, this text, but for those who haven't seen it, um, this, the Gospel of Thomas opens as one of these sayings. Jesus said, if your leaders say to you, look, the kingdom is in, up there, then the birds will get there first. And if they say it's in the ocean, the fish will get there first. So it's a kind of ironic way of saying, look, the kingdom of God isn't a place in space. 
And it's not an event in time. You think it's something going to happen at the end, the end of time, the day of judgment. But that's not it either, at least according to the secret teaching. Instead, this, this saying continues, the kingdom of God is within you. And when you come to know who you are, when you come to know that you're children of God, uh, then you will know the kingdom. It echoes Luke's saying, the kingdom of God is within you. But here, the disciples don't understand, just as they don't in the Gospels that you're familiar with or more familiar with. And they keep saying, when is it coming? When is the end? Come on, when is the, what's the time? And here, Jesus doesn't say what he says in the other Gospels. He says, Have you, do you know where, where things began? Why do you keep looking for the end? Why don't you go back to the beginning of time? Go back before the beginning of time. Then you'll find out something. How can you do that? How do you go back to the beginning of time? Before the beginning, we can't do that. But rabbis would have known how you do that. You go back to the book called Genesis, which means beginning, of course. And what Genesis says, as, as you know, is that before there was a world, there was deep water, and there was a wind from God or spirit, ruach, right? And then God said, let there be light, and there was light. But that light, of course, wasn't the light of the sun or the moon because they hadn't, the world hadn't been created yet. So when it speaks about the light that was created at the beginning of time, it's using a metaphor, light, for the energy, the divine energy from which the world came forth, the energy uh, from which everything began. And, and when... Uh, Rabbis in the first century would say, and when it comes to the question of God created humans in his image, what image? You're not supposed to make an image of the God of Israel, right? You can't make a statue or you can't do what Christian uh, later, this is an Italian Christian uh, painter, makes an image of the Lord. But that's prohibited in ancient Israel. So what, what could they be the image of God in us? And it seems that the answer came to many of the time. They would look at the book of Ezekiel, where the prophet Ezekiel says, at the, chapter 1, you know, I saw, I saw something. I saw the Lord on the throne. It, it was something like a human form, something like a human being, but he doesn't say he saw a human being. He says, I saw... Well, I saw lightning, I saw fire, I saw jewels, I saw shining and radiance and fire and, and, and kavod, right? Shining, glory, the glory of God. So all you could say, how, what's the image of God? Well, they would say the image you can use for the God of Israel is light, just this kind of radiant light. So the Gospel of Thomas follows that thought suggesting that being created in the image of God means that hidden deep inside of us, there's a kind of energy, call it a light, which, which can sort of links us to the source from which we all came, the source from which everything came from the beginning of time. And this gospel also suggests that Jesus speaks as if he were some kind of voice from that light. Uh, this is a quite amazing saying, saying 77 when he says, I am the light that is before creation. I am all things. Split a piece of wood and I am there. Lift up a rock and you will find me. It's as though the divine energy from which everything comes pervades everything in the universe, the stars, the stones, the trees, the creatures, the humans, everything. So, in this gospel, the primary question is not who is Jesus, which is a primary question, say, for Mark. In fact, a more primary question perhaps here is, who are you? Who are we? Who do you think you are? So, the gospel of Thomas suggests that if you want to understand who you are, you have to look within um, and says that 
within a person, there's light. And if it's illuminated, everything, uh, light, it lights up the world for you. But if it's not illuminated, everything can look very dark. And to find that light, you have to look. You have to look for it within yourself and find out who are you, um, who are you really. Obviously, this isn't a question about ordinary identity. It's not a question about the questions that's on the birth certificate or the driver's license or anything like that, because what they do is differentiate everyone here from everyone else. So we all have different names, different birth dates, different points of origin, different families, different, you know, as many points of difference as you can possibly have. Uh, the more specific is the identification. But in the Gospel of Thomas, looking for spiritual identity, it suggests that spiritual identity is collective. Um, in this Gospel, there's a kind of ritual passage. It looks like a baptismal passage where Jesus tells his disciples, when people ask you, plural, you, plural, where do you come from? You don't say, well, I come from, you know, I, I was born in such a place. You say, we, all of us, we came from the light, where the light came into being at the beginning of time. And when they say, who are you then? Say, we are children of the light. We're children of the living father and the spirit, which is the mother. So the point of this identification is that we all belong to the same family. And this identity is what is similar. It's not what is different. So it's not about what you believe, this text. It's about how we experience our connection with the source from which we come. And that saying at the start, when you come to know yourselves and who you really are, you'll know that you are children of the living God. Even the suggestion that this is written down by a disciple who in the Gospel of John is called Judas, the twin. Well, Didymus in Greek, as many people here know, means twin. And Thomas means twin in Aramaic. So it's like this disciple's name is Judas, but he's not Judas Iscariot. He's the other Judas. But they call him Thomas, the twin. And this is like saying, the twin, the twin. And I think this wasn't meant to be literal in any way. The first readers of the Gospel of Thomas say, did Jesus have a twin brother? But this, of course, is a metaphor like so much else in the Gospel of Thomas. It's, it's, there's a later saying in which Jesus says to Thomas, whoever receives my teaching becomes like me. I will become that person, and the mysteries will be revealed to that person. So it's like Thomas comes to see that he and Jesus are, in effect, twins that Jesus is um, a counterpart to any of us. So finally, what kind of knowing is gnosis? That's, we called them Gnostic texts. We didn't know what to call them. This isn't knowledge in the mind. It's not conceptual, right? It's, in Greek, as in so many other languages, there are two words for knowing. Uh, the word for conceptual intellectual knowing, like, do you know mathematics? That's the word in Greek, idein, which means something you have seen in the mind. Like, you know, you see uh, in your mind a cat, if we say cat. And, and, but that's an idea, something seen in the mind. But this kind of knowing is heart knowledge, right? This, this is, the word recognize comes out of gnosis. Do you recognize that person? Do you know who you are? Do you know God? What do you know? That's a very different kind of knowing. And you see the same distinction in French, Spanish, and German between wait, saber, conocer, or connaître, and savoir, or canon and wissen. So in Greek, you have this real difference of what it means to know, to know with the heart. And once you recognize you're a member of the same family, you act accordingly. This saying is from the Gospel of Truth. You, you act as though all of these people are your family. 
So this is what I came to understand from the sources. There's a paradox here. It says there are things we cannot know because the, the reality from which we came, the source from which we came is so transcendent that we don't have the capacity to understand that source, that what God is. But we can know that we are connected. And they quote the words in the book of Acts, in him we live and move and have our being. We can know we're connected with the source. So I want to say that at this point in my life, I found that the Gospels, especially Thomas, helped serve a much deeper need to find meaning. Uh, it never mattered more than when, uh, at a time when I would say meaning lost all meaning. That's a quote from this woman. Her, she was a Russian Orthodox woman living in Paris in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and she was thought by Russian Orthodox Church and still is revered as a kind of a saint, a woman of great piety and, and great generosity at the time to many people in desperate need of help during the Second World War in Paris. But she said when her six-year-old daughter died, she said, meaning lost all meaning. And that I really identified with um, when something like that happened to me. That's where it gets pretty personal. Um, when my husband and I, wanting a child so long, finally had a child that we loved and adored, um, who died when he was six of a very rare disease. Um, and then just about a year later, um, my wonderful husband actually died in a hiking accident very suddenly. It was overwhelming. And something happened um, at the service for our son. This is at the service for our son in, in a church in New York. Um, I just didn't want to be there. I, I wanted to go out of the world. I, di I didn't want to die exactly. I just didn't want to feel the pain. And I just wanted to be gone. I was standing in the back of the church and so many people who had come to see us that day. And as I was standing there, I had this sort of sense of a vision. It wasn't a, it wasn't a hallucination. It wasn't something I saw literally. I just felt that the people in that back part of the church as they streamed through it <clears throat> to give us hugs and so forth in a state of desolation, I felt that there was like this huge net made out of ropes that surrounded the whole place. And, and the spaces between the net were so big that you, would, you could just be sucked out of the world into oblivion. And I wanted to be in many ways. Didn't want to be there. But I felt that the places where the ropes connected, that's why I used the spider web, the places where the, the ropes of the, of the net connected were the relationships that held us in the world. And so that's when the Gospel of Thomas and the perception that it had spoke most deeply about the connectedness of all of us. And I was struck very deeply, too, by the book of Viktor Frankl. I'm sure many of you know it. Viktor Frankl, a Jewish psychiatrist, writes of his experience in Auschwitz that what matters most in life is a quest for meaning. And, and somehow there was a sense of that in this experience. You have to bring it forth. I, I got that from Thomas. And then Frankel said, and when you can't find meaning, because what happens seems so senseless, and the kind of suffering um, that is social suffering, as James Cohn would call it, is much harder to bear. When you can't find meaning, your job is to create it. And you, I think many of you know what I mean and what he meant. I thought of those students in Parkland, Florida, the picture up there on, uh, on that side, uh, seeing their classmates shot to death in front of them in their high school classrooms. 
and how they went out on a crusade to try to stop gun violence so that other people wouldn't have to suffer the same agony that they did and, and the families of those whose children were killed. So that was creating meaning out of a senseless and horrible killing. Then, of course, we all know about the demonstrations all over the world about the death of, of George Floyd, which was about saying, here's another senseless, cruel, terrible death. But people wanted to create meaning and say, no, this matters. We will not allow this kind of thing to go on as it has for so long, unnoticed, <laughs> as though it had never happened. We are going to make it matter. Um, Mary of Paris also decided to create meaning. There's a remarkable story that I found very moving. After her six-year-old daughter uh, had died, the Nazis were rounding up Jews in the square in the middle of Paris to take them to Auschwitz. And she slipped into the, into the square and persuaded some of the parents to allow her to hide their children in garbage dumps. And the children survived. And after that, she found families for them while their families were gone. And later, she and her son were both uh, imprisoned by the Nazis for anti-Nazi activity and put in the camps themselves, uh, where she died in the concentration camp as well. So that, for her, however, was making meaning. right? So that other people wouldn't suffer the same. And then this demonstration for gun violence. In, in our case, it was a matter of finding children who needed parents as much as we needed children. We found two little children who were babies uh, whose mothers couldn't raise them, people, young women who got pregnant in high school and had their children adopted. So we raised two children. That was an attempt to find meaning, to give what we wanted to give to our son to some child or some children who needed it. But this wasn't a simple recognition. And I had to ask myself, what prevents us from recognizing our connection with our source and with each other? And it came down for me to this. Grief, guilt, anger. So fourth question, finally, why does it matter to think critically about our religious traditions? There are lots of reasons for that, which I love to talk about. But this will be the end of it. Um, one reason it's important to do that, I feel, as a teacher, is because some of the traditions we get raised with are helpful, and some of them are harmful. Um, because guilt and anger can make the isolation of grief much worse. And sometimes there are stories in the Bible that intensify both of those. One example here. When a child dies, almost invariably the parents feel guilty. Because, you know, every parent here and everyone else knows that it's your job as a parent to keep a child alive. And if you can't do that, no matter how hard you try, you feel like you failed, and you have in a way. And that's certainly how it, it felt. Um, and that's why many people in that situation never talk about a child who dies or a baby who dies. And I went back and looked at the Bible, and I read the story of David and Bathsheba. And you know the story about how King David desires this woman, Bathsheba, married to somebody else, has her husband conveniently killed, and, and just has his men go seize her, gets her pregnant, and then it says, and the Lord smote the infant, the baby boy that was born to them, and it died because of the sin of David and Bathsheba. And I thought, wow, it's not just that I feel guilty that the child died, despite everything we did to try to save his life. It's that I was taught culturally that if a child dies, that, that it's probably the parent's fault and actually that is kind of reinforced. So there are some sources in the Bible that can be more trouble than help. Um, and that's one thing we can learn from doing this. 
But besides alerting us from culturally taught reactions from which we may need to release ourselves, like attitudes in the Bible, which many people here, um, one reason they have come to Wake Forest is to let go of certain things they've been taught that the Bible says and the Bible teaches and understand it differently. So thinking about these traditions can release us from some negative elements of the tradition. But more importantly, maybe, it also allows us to discover a lot more, including the library of mystical sources that we we call them Gnostic Gospels, but really they're, they're, they're Christian Gospels. Uh, Gnosticism is a kind of polemical term. It always was an, a, term, a term that was created to attack these sources. For example, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene offers other ways of understanding Christian tradition. This gospel was widely translated uh, in the ancient world from the second century. It was written in Greek, like the New Testament, but it was totally destroyed, effectively destroyed, by leaders of the Christian church. There's one fragment that's left in Ethiopic, uh, and this is an Ethiopian picture of Mary Magdalene holding an egg to symbolize new life. And you can see, as soon as you read the Gospel of Mary, what's wrong with it from the Orthodox point of view. Because here, Peter asks Jesus, what is the sin of the world? And Jesus says, there is no sin of the world. Instead, sin is something you make when you do things that are wrong. So it's a direct contradiction of the Gospel of John. And also in this Gospel, um, Mary Magdalene says she's had a vision and she's uh, spoken to the Lord, and, and he told her things, and Peter gets very angry and says, are we supposed to listen to her? No, we're not going to do that. And, and, um, and that is uh, another reason that this gospel is not part of the New Testament, because it suggests that Mary was, in fact, a teacher and somebody who received genuine revelations. But this gospel also echoes what you see in Thomas, saying, Mary says in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the, sin, the Son of Man is within you, follow him. So these are just a couple of hints of how these, this whole 50 texts, and I'm only mentioning a couple because we need to keep it short. Uh, the secret revelation of John is another one that also oh, offers a quite a different interpretation of what we have come to know in Orthodox tradition as the Trinity. That is, the three persona, the Greek word, you know, means masks, the three forms in which, the, in which God appears. Um, this is a story about the disciple John. After the death of Jesus, he goes into the desert weeping, devastated. And he says, suddenly, the earth shook, and he, he saw a brilliant light, and he heard Jesus speaking to him and saying, John, John, why do you weep? I am the one who is with you always. I am the father, I am the mother, and I am the son. And here you see that if Jesus were speaking in Aramaic, or if his followers were writing in Aramaic or Hebrew or Syriac, they would have thought of, of the Holy Spirit as a feminine power, as the mother. And she appears as the mother in many, many of these texts. But when you translate that word into Greek, it becomes neuter. So you don't get a sense of gender at all. You only get the gender of the father and the son. And when I read this, I thought, well, who would you expect to find with the father and the son? It would obviously be the mother. Anyway, that's just a hint of the many enormous discoveries that we have yet to make. These Gospels aren't really so much about what you're supposed to believe, but more about what people experience. Uh, one of the texts says, these things may have happened to each one of us. These are stories that you can identify with, um, and I find them quite compelling, some of them more than others, because there's a wide range. But the Nag Hammadi um, texts are opening up a wide range of interpretations of the Gospels. And I, I'm not suggesting, just in conclusion, that, that this means that, you know, one should jettison the Gospels we have, throw away Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and adopt these. Rather, 
They were never meant to replace the others. They were meant to supplement them so that these are kind of like advanced level teachings. The New Testament Gospels give you the public teaching of Jesus, and these claim to give you the deeper teaching of Jesus. Um, that's why they were loved by Christians who tried to uh, go into uh, further levels of understanding. So finally, I just wanted to suggest before opening it up that exploring these traditions invites us to discover for ourselves what is true and engage a spiritual dimension. I was thinking of William James' um, varieties of religious experience when he says, the further limits of our being plunge us into another dimension of existence altogether. So with that, I want to stop and open up our discussion. Thank you. While folks get situated, I want to ask a question that we've been talking about through the afternoon, um, which is this real question about orthodoxy. And y you, hit, you hit on it toward the end of, end of the lecture of the talk today. Um, part of what you've argued in your earlier work and what you trace in Why Religion is that these impulses of orthodoxy have buried diverse theologies, have buried diverse pictures of Jesus um, in the tradition. So how would we imagine, how might we imagine Christianity today if these secrets were no longer secret, if they had not been secrets for the last 2,000 years? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I'd have to think about that one, Catherine, because I think that, you know, orthodoxy was an attempt to unify an extremely complex and diversified movement, and it, it helped create connections between Christians in Spain and Africa and Germany and all over the world. It, it created a kind of unity that, that I think Irenaeus, who, who was worried about persecution, um, wanted to, you know, bind people together so that they say, well, what's, what, is the, what are the simple stuff that we all agree on? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the texts that are easiest to read are the ones, the narrative stories of Jesus. So I don't know, these, would, these might open up a much wider range, but what it shows is that the early Christian movement was a much wider range and, and, and it expanded in many ways that we don't necessarily know about now and that we need not feel bound to what the narrow stream of what we call orthodoxy, uh, even though many people love those traditions, um, we can open it up much further. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I mean, I think about, when I think about this, I think about the contestations that are happening or the negotiations that are happening. And, and um, these texts are in conversation with texts we already know. They're not sort of written in a vacuum without being part of what we have already experienced. Those of us, I guess I'm, I'm noting we as Orthodox Christians, so-called, right? Um, so, you know, you were, you were speaking earlier this afternoon a little bit about how John, the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Thomas are really in conversation with each other. And it's fascinating to think about these texts as having conversations. I really love to look at the early history of Christianity before the creeds were invented because the creeds try to nail down what does everybody believe? Let's all say the same thing all the time, um, whether or not we understand what it means. I mean, the creeds are part of, part of the worship of many Christians and the worship that's, with which I'm most familiar as well. But you can see, look at them as a kind of tone poem, as a kind of song, or as a, as a demand that you believe exactly this and this and this. And, and that, I think, is contrary to much of the spirit of the early Christian movement. I mean, what I love about the early centuries is that there's so much more expansion and range um, for what these various people and groups might have thought the good news was or is. So that, that actually brings up yet another question about um, these texts that were missing, right? These 51 texts that we find in the Nag Hammadi find. Um, what do you think they have in common? Why, why, were, why those texts? Why were those texts chosen? Was it gender and sexuality? Was it authority? Was it um, their view of Jesus? I mean, do you have any sense of 
why those texts are hidden from us? Probably there, there are multiple reasons, right? But one of the things you notice most is that the Gospels that are in the New Testament all talk about Jesus as really unique. Jesus is very important. He's the only son of God, as John depicts him. And you have to be saved through him. And that becomes a powerful focus for an institutional church which claims you can only be saved through the church. I mean, Irenaeus, as the founder of orthodoxy, famously said, outside the church, there is no salvation. Now, Jesus didn't have a church like that. Um, he wasn't a Christian. I keep reminding my <laughs> students uh, that Christianity hadn't been invented yet. Yeah. And so the question of, of how we understand the good news is quite different from the process of institutionalizing a very widely diverse movement in the fourth century. And so, and yet that's what it becomes, and that it becomes narrowed down in that way. I think it's mainly about the uniqueness of Jesus and the importance of, you know, believing in Jesus alone is what gives you salvation. That's what Irenaeus said, outside the church, no salvation. And that becomes a dominant theme for Christianity ever since. Not every Christian would agree to that. And I'm sure there are many here who would, who would see it differently. But, uh, but that is what became Right, that uniqueness of Jesus really add, adds that sort of singular power, a divine authorization for singular power yeah. into the tradition. It's about authority, I think. Yeah. yeah. But these texts invite people to claim for yourself, do you think this is right? Does this sound bizarre to you? Does it sound off? Is it wrong? Or does it sound, does it resonate as true? And of course, Irenaeus and others created orthodoxy to solve the problem that we call discernment of spirits, you know, which, which, which things are true and which are not. And that's a very hard question. Yes. And so many people would rather have it solved for them uh, by, by a council of bishops. And this, the challenge of these texts is that it raises that question again. But I think it's important in the 21st century when many people are, love these traditions and many people are leaving these traditions to raise those questions again. Wow. Yes. <laughs> so I want to I wanna switch gears a little bit, um, a little bit more to the, the more personal elements of your, of your conversation, or pardon me, of your talk earlier today. And so the first, the first question I, goes into this idea of a cultural shape of Christianity, right? And, and that it was your research that, that drew you more into these texts. But there are some for whom research isn't a warrant for truth, right? In our research is, research is not a warrant for truth. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how do you answer critics? Um, how would you explore, entertain? How do you help folks like that explore a different perspective with these texts? Well, there's nothing to indicate that, that anyone should agree with these texts. <laughs> I found them resonant, some of them more than others. There, it's a very diverse collection, but I guess it just raises that question in any sphere of our lives. You know, what do you take to be true? Um, how do you make a decision like that? So do you find yourself believing differently, having studied these Gospels oh, yes, for so long? Oh, yes, I do. I mean, I, I came to the conclusion that identifying Christianity as sort of a bunch of things you have to believe in is kind of limiting. That th these are traditions. These are rituals and poems and prayers and stories, thousands of them, that, that have been collected over thousands of years. I mean, you can't... You can't believe all of it, it would be, you can't swallow all of it. I think it's sort of indigestible, right? There's too much. So all of us make selections about what we focus on and what we, we what calls to us and what we gravitate toward. And this, to me, was kind of liberating to realize that it's not a question of believing in a specific set of doctrines that defines the Christian traditions complex as they are. So with these 
new texts that are discovered and, and sort of the opening of imagination and the opening of, um, of these endlessly fascinating new ideas, do you think we need to talk about expanding the canon? It depends what the canon is for. I mean, the canon was meant to define the books to read in church. It never was meant to include mystical teachings. It was meant to be the sort of basic elementary teachings that everybody could hear. And the easiest of those are the four Gospels of the New Testament because of their, their memorable stories, right? There are a lot of remarkable stories. So the canon should probably not be ex extended because if that's what it's for. But the problem with the Christian canon, one of them that I have, is that it was a closed canon. There was no necessary assumption that you would just say these four and no more. But, but the question, of course, that bothered the fathers of the church is that if you have a revelation that you want to add, it has to agree with all the previous traditions. Otherwise, you're obviously wrong. So you can't overtly diverge. You have to pretend at least that you're doing what the early church did. Right. Right. And I think that's what's so fascinating then when you talk about your own visions, like the vision of the net that you shared with us earlier today is that um, I think what it, what it reveals to me is a sense of connection being ongoing and living, moving beyond what's in the historical world. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, what, what do you make of your own visions in, in some of this? Or is that too hard of a well, question? Well, I've, I've, I've never asked that question. <laughs> I've never asked that question. I, I think that many people have recognitions that come from experience that I just don't it know just, how to ask that question. Yeah, no, I, I, and that's, that's fine because um, I think what you've described for us is very intensely personal, both in your experience and in your, your working out of meaning making. Um, so I have another question about meaning making then, which is that you speak a, at times in, throughout the book about ritual. And you, know, you showed us the, or talked a little bit today about the Billy Graham crusade that was one of the largest kinds of rituals um, that are part of the, um, part of our life together or have been part of our collective history. And you also talk about funerals, you talk about um, meditation, you talk about lots of different kinds of rituals throughout the, throughout the book. And um, one of the rituals that you and I shared, and we talked about this earlier, was that in 2013, I actually was one of the thousands of graduates out in that sea of people um, as you were on the stage earning your uh, honorary doctorate. What role did that staging of religion play, do you think, for you? And I'm not, I guess I'm not calling this, that ceremony religion, but what, a ritual. What role does ritual well, play? Well, what is a ritual? I mean, ritual is a focused, a focused act that, that we, and often it's an it's a act that involves uh, a group of people, and they focus on a particular intent. And that can be a formal ritual, like a marriage, a funeral, a baptism. Uh, I think there's great power in that. I also learned that in New York from a performance artist named Mary Beth Adelson, who, who was doing performance art in New York as ritual. Um, she was doing, she was creating her own rituals. Mm -hmm. And that's another way that people can focus attention. And there's power when people do that. I'm sure people here are very much aware of that. Right. Whether they're rituals we share publicly or in churches or rituals that we invent ourselves. So what, what importance would you put on, on ritual or practice or, or meaning making um, in, the, in the midst of intense grief and personal suffering? I mean, it, it, does ritual hold you within that, that space or is it, um, is the community what, what holds one in that space? I guess I'm asking, um, I'm asking the theodicy question. 
I know. In so many ways, well, and I'm, I'm trying to you, dance around you, it because I know you, we can't you, answer you're, it. You're more theologically inclined than I am. <laughs> so I guess I should, there are many people here I could ask those questions of. Okay, I think we should, I think we have one more question, um, and then we, we probably need to close out our time together. Um, and I think maybe one of, the, one of the questions is to go back to the broader, the broader sphere in that you mention um, multiple religious traditions throughout Why Religion and, and the connections, even as you're very grounded in the cultural Christianity of, of American Protestantism, really. Um, but have you, what have you learned about Eastern and Western traditions about other traditions through your study of the Gnostic Gospels? And here it might be, I mean, well, this is one of the places where I'm fascinated about the class course you taught about Jesus and the Buddha. Well, I, I suggested to a colleague of mine, um, who's a, he's a specialist in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, translates 11th century Tibetan texts, and I, I said, why don't we do a course called Jesus and Buddha, and, and we'll sort of shape it on the lives of the founders. We'll say, okay, what kind of family and background is, is said about the Buddha, and what kind of family and background is said about Jesus, and then the story, when did... Siddhartha become the awakened one. What, what was the event that made him a Buddha? And they call it, in the Buddhists call it the awakening, right? And when Jesus of Nazareth becomes the Christ, it's the baptism scene, right? The Holy Spirit comes down and he becomes anointed with the Spirit. So we took these and then what kind of community does each establish? It was wonderful to do this. I didn't know much about Buddhism and he didn't know much about Christianity. And one thing we, we sort of blew apart was the old cliche that all religions really say the same thing because they don't. Mm -hmm. Buddhism and Christianity are so different when it comes to how we understand a lifetime, how we understand the afterlife, how we understand the invisible world of angelic and demonic forces, how we understand sin and illness and uh, punishment and reward. and. They're enormously different, cosmologically, in so many ways. Um, when it came to the heart of it, though, the teachings of, say, Matthew 5, Luke 6 and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and some of the Buddhist teachings about karma, which, which says, what happens to you has everything to do with the, your actions in the world. Your actions will create a situation that will come back to you, either harmful or, or a blessing. And, and that seemed to me is quite similar to the message of Jesus when he speaks about the judgment of God, right? Mm -hmm. He speaks about, you know, what, what you do to others will be done to you. Uh, what will come to you in the judgment is what is the way you treat other people. As Luke says, what you give to others will be what you get for better and for worse. And that struck me that that deep moral core mm. of those traditions struck us as powerfully resonant, while so much else is so different. And uh, I love studying these other traditions because we get different ways of understanding all of the questions. Right, that resonance is so beautiful, and I think that's a great, a great place to end our time together here on the stage. Um, let me thank one more time. Let's thank one more time Dr. Peggles for her thank for sharing you. with us. For those who are interested in purchasing her Why Religion book, um, Bookmarks has a table in the narthex of the chapel, um, and there are some limited signed copies if you um, would like a signed copy as well. So thank you again. Thank you to the Strickland family for this opportunity, and thank you all for coming to the School of Divinity for this afternoon of intellectual delights. Thank you. Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you.